So, I'm going to start uh, with something that perhaps most of you didn't know, that, that nuclear medicine, as we know it in the image, uh, pet traces were there right at the beginning. And one of the first agents that was used in, in uh, nuclear medicine was sodium chloride as a bone scanning agent with a, a, a device called a rectilinear scanner, which had a little, like a Geiger-Muller counter that went dot by dot uh, over, over things like the legs and took pictures like this. Uh, because it had a very narrow collimator, it uh, didn't matter what the energy of the, uh, the tracer was. And uh, uh, you know, it's really nice to be here at the Prince of Wales because one of the pioneers of bone scanning in the world was uh, Professor Proven Murray, who was, I think, Monica's uh, mentor. Uh, and uh, this is a picture I took when I came up here a long time ago. And uh, Proven shared with me uh, a little bit of uh, history uh, that, that links Peter Mack and the Prince of Wales because in the early days of uh, um, nuclear medicine uh, at Lucas Heights they made at one of the first technician uh, uh, polyphosphate agents for bone scanning and it was flown in a light plane down to Melbourne uh, where it went to John Andrews and, and JJ Martin at Peter Mack and they did a bone scan simultaneously with Proven on a rectilinear scanner comparing sodium fluoride with technetium polyphosphate. And if you look at the pictures, you say, why did we ever go to technetium imaging? Because this is the same patient. There's a lot more uh, you know, non-specific background uptake in, in, in the, uh, the normal skeleton relative to the tumor deposits compared to fluoride. But the reason that it, it really changed was that the technology changed. We've got a really much better trace uh, camera. Um, uh, we went from the rectilinear scanner, which took hours and hours to acquire, to what were called jumbo gamma cameras. And this was one of the first uh, jumbo gamma cameras uh, uh, in Australia at the Repat Hospital where I came back from the United States to work. Uh, and the fact that it just recently been retired by Barry Arkins here. But instead of a, a, a collimator that got one dot, you got 15 centimetres luxury of field of view uh, to see the whole body. And, and the problem with that new technology was that pet traces couldn't be imaged on it. They had too high energy. They were really, really poorly imaged. And so you was, there was a trans transition in radiopharmaceuticals from those which were good for the rectilinear scanner to those which were optimised for the new technology. So now we have a technology that's really good for looking at, uh, at positron emitting uh, isotopes. And these are the comparison of the sodium fluoride scan. It looks as good on, on your screen as it does on my screen. Uh, uh, and a te technician at HD, but more NDP scan, a regular bone scan. Uh, but if you can't see it too well, this is the detail that you get from a better technology. You can see each individual cervical vertebra, the foramina, the, the lamina, just exquisite uh, detail. But more than that, this is a fully 3D quantitative uh, image, and then you can look at it from top to toe. And the difference is that the one on the left is acquired in 10 minutes, one hour after injection. The one on the right takes 45 minutes, three or four hours after injection. So you think of the patient convenience, you think of the, 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 the technologist's time, and even the amortization of equipment. Uh, 10 minutes versus 45 minutes, it has to be four and a half times more expensive to, to um, uh, run out of money uh, on that. We think it's, it's very cost effective uh, technology. And when you see the pictures, they're just exquisite. The contrast and resolution you can get on pet is just so superior. You can see you know, individual articular surfaces. You can get beautiful 3D renders that uh, uh, pictures that orthopedic surgeons love this uh, to, to look at you know, specific joints and they can visualise it and then get in there and, and, and play with the images, cut them to pieces uh, before they cut the patient to pieces. Uh, and, you know, when we're looking at things like small bony metastases, the ability to detect them, to localise them, to, to compare with the CT is really just exquisite. And diseases like prostate cancer with elevated uh, PSA levels, just dramatically more sensitive than conventional bone scan. A lot of that comes down to the physics. Uh, unlike the gamma camera where you have to stick a huge hunk of lead on the front of the camera called the collimator, and you collect only a very small proportion of all the uh, radioactive emissions that come out of the body, uh, only those that are 
directly perpendicular to the face of the camera are collected. So it's a very insensitive technique. PET is, is a ring with no collimation and you detect a much larger percentage of the emissions that, that are emitted. And so we have uh, a fully 3D inherently quantitative technique versus a um, semi-quantitative and, and much less sensitive technique. And we, we've, we've now moved to the, the, the next revolution in scanner technology is combining the structure with function uh, in both PET-CT and, and SPEC-CT. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the, one of the, my battles, and it's nice that Rollins here has been with MSAC over more than a decade, trying to convince uh, them that these new technologies, uh, which are so clearly superior, uh, should be replacing what we, we've, we've done in the past. Uh, they would have us uh, use this, <laughs> drive the old car till it's dead, uh, when we could be driving the Ferrari S, and then the Rob might say that's a much more expensive car, but it works, and it gets you from A to B, and we'd all like to drive Ferraris, and particularly if someone else is to work. In terms of uh, uh, the, um, uh, um, the technology, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the data we're looking at, the evidence base for PET, was based on stuff that my group and other groups uh, did back in the 90s, and it was using a technology that has been in evolution. Uh, it's, it's improved just dramatically, even in the last five years. Uh, so this is a series you know, uh, of, of images uh, over the years, and I remember going to a meeting uh, back in the, in the uh, 80s where they were still using an ECAT 2 at, at, at St Vincent's Hospital. And they, in, in um, um, sorry, not uh, the uh, Mallinckrodt Institute in St Louis, uh, and one of the doctors got up and said, oh, we can't really tell the difference between uh, Alzheimer's disease and multi-infarct dementia, and they were using an ECAT 2 and uh, one of the Italians, a guy called Fazio, had one of the ECAT 931s, and he got up, he said, I come up from Milan, in, in Italy, we have a two kinds of cars. We have the Ferrari, we have the Fiat. Uh, if I want to go from Milano to Roma, it takes me f f two, three hours in the Ferrari. In the Fiat, I never get there. <laughs> my, my question for you is this. Uh, what what your results be if you have the Ferrari and not the Fiat? <laughs> and the American guy says, I don't quite get your question. <laughs> So this, this, is, this is the Ferrari with the turbocharge now, the time of flight PET scanners, and you can see this is the evolution in the quality. You can start to see substructures within the brain with this new, new technology, it's really quite exquisite. And so the advantages of PET over SPECT, you know, you've got obviously your multi-slice CT, you've got much better quantitation, superior spatial resolution, fully 3D dynamic imaging, and I'll show you examples of that, superior temporal and spatial resolution, very high sensitivity, and because of the speed, it also becomes cost effective, even though it's a more expensive technology intrinsically in terms of capital equipment. And if we look at the, the, the sort of mix of the things, I'm sorry, it's the, the, one of them's gone to speed uh, there, but the, the, the three, uh, sorry, four <coughs> critical things that, that you need in the ideal imaging, high imaging, quality speed, low cost, and availability of radio traces. Everyone has said, well, image quality, speed is on the side of uh, PET and cost of radio traces on the side of um, the SPEC. There's many more traces available for SPEC imaging than there are for, for, um, for PET imaging. But it shouldn't be so. Uh, you know, Michael Hoffman and I wrote a, an article, a, a, a piece for Nature Reviews Clinical Ecology a couple of years ago where we outlined that almost every single test that we do in nuclear medicine can be replaced by a PET equivalent uh, with higher resolution, spatial and, uh, and temporal, higher uh, contrast and lower radiation dose in the vast majority of cases. We can also start to overcome some of the, the limitations of the the techniques that we have by going from non-specific traces, like looking at osteoblastic activity, to more mm -hmm. things that are more uh, specific of the cancer process, like cell membrane formation. So this is a patient with prostate cancer, the, 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 
the image on the, uh, the left is a, is a conventional bone scan. The one on the, the, uh, the, the right is a fluorocholine scan, which is um, incorporated into phosphatidylcholine, and so any cells that are active in forming uh, cell membrane will have high uh, fluorocholine uptake. And if you look there, the, the big difference is not in sensitivity, but rather in specificity, the ability to identify what's cancer and what's not uh, on the scan. Even though the accuracy is you know, only marginally better, 81 versus 87, the big difference in the, in the specificity, 91 versus 54, toss of a coin versus something that's enough to make clinicians make you know, robust management decisions. And these images really, uh, again, very high sensitivity. You can see nodes that are not structurally enlarged. These, these are uh, the primary cancer, uh, a node that's you know, sub-centimetre node, not abnormal on, on CT by any stretch of the imagination, but clearly seen in a small bone uh, metastasis in a patient with no structural abnormality on the correlative CT. The sensitivity is there, the, the specificity is, is high. We can also start to overcome some of the limitations of PET. Uh, if we use more traces, there's high uptake in the brain, so that limits our ability to detect uh, lesions uh, in the brain. And although you can see this lesion, it's a cerebral lymphoma, which has amongst the highest glycolytic rate of any tumour, uh, but the one on the right, if you're paying money, if you're, if you're a purchaser, would you buy that one or would you buy that one? I know what I would buy. And you can see you know, tiny little um, uh, metastases because of that very high uh, um, uptake and the high contrast that you get. Uh, and in particularly in areas of complex anatomy, the ability to combine these very sensitive high contrast traces with detailed anatomical imaging. So this is a uh, base of skull SCC that's uh, eroding up through the uh, uh, jagged frame and, and, and uh, uh, frame the tongue uh, from from the nose in, into the uh, uh, into the brain, and you can see it going into the middle uh, cranial fossa there, uh, quite quite exquisitely. We can look at processes for which there are, for example, item numbers. There is an item number in the Medicare schedule for bone marrow imaging, and you can do anything you like. For that. You can give a nanocolloid, you can do labelled white cells, you can do all sorts of things. None of them actually look at bone marrow proliferation, which is what you're interested in if you're doing a bone marrow scan. This is a patient who's been heavily pre-treated with radiotherapy, chemotherapy. Uh, the, the, the patient had relapsed uh, with, um, with lymphoma and had recently had uh, some uh, radiotherapy to supraclavicular disease and had new disease in the pelvis and they're wondering how much bone marrow was left and what the effects of the bone marrow, uh, the, the radiation were. And so here's an area that had just been irradiated uh, three weeks prior to this scan. Uh, and you can see when we superimpose the isodose contours onto the bone marrow scan, that there is a complete loss of bone marrow proliferation corresponding exactly to the five gray isocontour. And we know that from radiation biology, you get a whole body exposure of five gray, you, you will stop producing um, uh, blood for quite a considerable period of time, but your bone marrow will recover. You go more than 10 gray, it never recovers. You have to have a bone marrow transplant. And so here's, here's the five gray ISO contour proven in an individual patient that, that there, there is uh, a loss of marrow proliferation, at least transitly. And one would predict with only five gray that it should come back. And so here's four months later, there's the recovery partially of, of bone marrow in that very region. And, and on the basis of this, we can actually quantify the extent and location and how much bone marrow you will lose in the radiation field. So we're really imaging bone marrow, bone marrow proliferation, giving clinicians the answer. And I think, uh, Robin, that the uh, MSAC uh, and health technology should be paying for answers, not for tests. And so bone marrow imaging, this is bone marrow imaging, I think the only one to do it. Uh, we, we're living the dream uh, at Peter Mac. Uh, you know, um, perhaps I'm a, a snake oil salesman and I've convinced our clinicians and our, our um, um, executive that this is the right way to go because it saves us money in the long run. 
Uh, but that's the growth of PET since I started at Peter Mac and started the program in 1996. You can see the growth, and this year we'll do over 8,000 PET scans in, in Peter Mac. And every time that it, it sort of flattens out there is when we've reached capacity. We can't do any more. We've increased our ca capacity to do scans by putting in new scans. We now operate three PET CTs. Uh, next year we hope to have a, a, another system uh, and it will increase. And that scares uh, a lot of the people. I think that, you know, well, this is just going to be uh, uh, profligate uh, use of, of, of imaging technology. I'll, I'll come back to that. This is the, the new Peter Mac that's being built at the moment. That's the view from the PET uh, uptake rooms. So if you want to have a PET scan in 2016 and you want to have a nice view of Melbourne, that's, that's the view you'll get when you're sitting in your chair uh, waiting for uptake. And that's the new Peter Mac taking, taking shape. And the reason I put it there, because we've put our money where our mouth is in terms of the design of this department. We've put four PET CTs into, into this room, plus a PET MR. Uh, we've only put two spec CTs in there. So if, if you think of any other nuclear medicine department in the world, they've got five, six, seven gamma cameras, and they've got maybe one PET CT if they're lucky. We're, we've invested you know, intellectually in this technology. And that's not because Peter Mac is flush with money. We're, we're, we're as uh, you know, struggling like every other uh, uh, healthcare organisation to make ends meet. And we're very focused on reducing healthcare expenditure, making uh, healthcare as efficient as possible. We don't want to be you know, doing things with no benefit, marginal benefit, you know, where there's a cheaper test. We're always trying to look for the, the most cost effective way to do it. And, uh, I was involved in a, 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 a commission uh, with Richard Sullivan for the Lancet Oncology where we looked at uh, the issue of imaging and, and I think made the case that we can't afford not to do better diagnostics and I'll show you why and I hope that you all got a, 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 an educated mind, the mark of an educated mind is, is to be able to entertain a thought without necessarily accepting it. So at least uh, I hope I can convince you uh, that there is some merit in spending a little bit more uh, potentially upfront in diagnosis than, than uh, we currently do. And the reason for that is in this um, chart from uh, the Lancet Oncology Commission, in terms of the economic impact of all diseases, cancer's number one. It, it, it costs us more as a community than any other disease. Despite the prevalence of cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer is still very, very expensive and becoming more expensive. In the OECD, 96 cents in every dollar in cancer is spent on delivering therapy. Four cents in every dollar is spent on diagnostics. And yet what do we make the decision on how we treat a patient? On pathology and imaging. Every, every decision we make is based on the diagnosis of the presence and extent of disease. And so if we don't get that right, if we don't spend those four cents wisely, we waste money on uh, the, the therapies that we deliver. Getting to the issue of the cost <coughs> differential, pets expensive, you need cyclotrons, you need chemists, you need all these new traces. If we really looked at the cost of producing spec isotopes, we'd be horrified. They're all subsidised by a huge amount of taxpayer investment in nuclear facilities around the world. No corporate industry could afford to put in reactors and the, the, we're finding this in the world because they're shutting down one by one as governments withdraw from, from uh, the nuclear industry. They're, they're shutting down reactors. They're getting smaller and smaller. And we've had a, a period of crisis in nuclear medicine with supply of technetium. A couple of these reactors have gone down for maintenance or for, for faults. Uh, that people couldn't do regular bone scans. They started doing fluoride scans in the US and still doing it. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly expensive and taxpayer super, uh, uh, supported uh, industry. You don't have to have a cyclotron to make many of the traces that we uh, um, you know, could replace a standard nuclear medicine with. And one of the, the, the new tools are these gamma generators, which were first described back in the 60s. It, it sits on, on your shelf for up to a year. And you can milk it several times a day and get isotopes 
uh, that can be labelled onto a whole range of biological pro uh, um, uh, chemicals uh, for, for imaging studies. Uh, this, this is quick, easy, it's, it's cheap, and there are now GMP um, certified products that are coming out that, that provide very high quality material. And the whole area of gallium chemistry has been driven by one peptide in the first instance, gallium octreotate, uh, where the comparison to the standard test is just chalk and cheese. The one on, on the left is, is a test that M's, uh, Medicare pays over $2,000 for, that the patient gets injected, comes back at 24 hours, sometimes at 48 hours, has conservatively with respect uh, more than an hour, maybe an hour and a quarter of imaging. The one on the right, they come in, they get injected 45 minutes, they're on the table, uh, uh, 45 minutes later they're on the table, and they have a scan of 15 minutes. And that's the comparison. There's four days between those two scans, and instead of having resection of what was thought to be a solitary nodal metastasis in the left supraclavicular fossa, this patient has hundreds of metastases uh, and clearly not a, a, a um, surgical option. So, and when we look at these and, and we can do diagnostic CTs uh, on them and we start to try and find the abnormalities that we can see on, on uh, the, the PET scan, it, it's very tough. You know, there's a two millimetre liver lesion we can see. We can't see the primary at all, even with a, 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 an arterial phase contrast material. And because the intensity of uptake is so intense, we can see structures that are smaller than the theoretical spatial resolution of the, the scanner. This is a two millimetre uh, deposit in the peritoneum. But because the target to background uh, ratio is so high, there's no problem seeing it. Uh, it's, it's a bit like um, uh, the filament in a light. As you, you turn up the dimmer switch, it goes from being very faint to, to, to looking like it's a massive um, uh, uh, ball of light. Same thing happens here. Uh, it's contrast that matters. It's not actually spatial resolution. Beyond using gallium for labelling of triotate, we can label a whole range of peptides, and one of the ones we've recently been working with is one called uh, Annexin 5, which is a fascinating peptide that comes from the saliva of the Gila monster. This is uh, one of the, the only lethal lizards in the world, and it kills its prey by biting them and injecting this peptide into them that causes them to have profound hypoglycemia. They become uh, uh, comatose and then the gila monster eats them um, uh, because of their hypoglycemia. And it's because these GLP-1 receptors are on the surface of, of the uh, beta cells in the islets of the pancreas, it's an agonist and, and it stimulates them to secrete insulin. And so there's a very high uh, density of these. And so for a disease like insulinoma, we have a, a, an aggregation of malignant or benign overgrowth of beta cells, incredibly sensitive to detecting uh, the disease. And you know, so this is a tiny little insulinoma. The patient had, had um, endoscopic ultrasound, had MRI, had dynamic contrast CT, had venous sampling. They couldn't localise it. Pretty easy to see. The, the lesion on, on this and makes a big difference. This patient had a tail of pancreas, uh, pancreas removed, confirmed that they had a, an insulinoma. This is a, a, a child who, who we did a couple of weeks ago uh, who was in intensive care on uh, high dose steroids, glucose infusions with neonatal hypoglycemia. And you can see again, focal uptake in the head of the pancreas. Um, uh, associated with a, uh, an overgrowth of beta uh, cells in that location and a really important um, differential diagnosis between diffuse mesidioblastosis where all of the beta cells in the, in the pancreas are um, uh, overactive versus a focal uh, abnormality which is potentially amenable uh, to, to surgical treatment. So does Gallium work. You know, I, I think it's very hard to sell clinicians on tests that don't work. You know, despite what you might think. 
This is the, the growth in gallium uh, uh, scans in, in our organisation over the, over the last few years. And that's because we can do virtually everything, as I said, that we do in general nuclear medicine more quickly at much lower radiation dose uh, and we think actually it might be cost effective. We can do bone scans with, with, with gallium uh, uh, diphosphonates. There's a whole raft of, of <coughs> biological processes and, and you know, sometime uh, I might come back, hopefully I'll get invited and talk to you about that linking of imaging phenotype with genotype and the whole the piece that we do in the research environment because it, it, you know, our ability to see, interrogate and modulate biological processes with imaging it is an incredible opportunity. But the, all, all these things on this slide, we have traces for uh, currently and, and, and are using them. One of the, the new ones that we're very excited about is looking at prostate uh, specific membrane antigen uh, for um, uh, prostate cancer, which is uh, uh, very, you know, it's a, a um, uh, carboxypeptidase, it lives on the cell surface, it's got very high um, uh, uptake in, in high grade tumours, um, and in, it's kind of nice because, you know, this whole debate about watch and wait, you know, are we detecting too many prostate cancers that, that aren't going to make a difference to the outcome of patients, that the low grade, low Gleason score, non-progressive, this um, target increases as Gleason score increases and increases uh, significantly uh, as the disease becomes more biologically uh, aggressive. We saw the target years ago. It was the target for an agent called prostacin, which never made it clinically. And the problem was not the technology, not the concept of targeting, but rather the technology we used. We used indium with a gamma camera back in the, the, the 80s and 90s where the pictures were just horrible. They, they, you, know, you had to go to a special course to learn to read them, and I don't think I ever mastered reading them. Did you, Monica? No, they're horrible. But this is the equivalent. You know, uh, clearly, uh, you know, here's a, a, a tiny uh, disease, uh, disease node. This is the first paper from our colleagues in, in Heidelberg at the German Cancer Centre who developed this uh, agent. Um, uh, a three millimeter presacral node clearly demonstrated, bony metastases clearly demonstrated. Inguinal nodes, uh, uh, paraortic nodes, that, uh, and I showed you that the thoracobling ones, you know, that's, that was the best we had. We thought it was really good. Uh, we've just done a randomized control trial of conventional imaging versus thoracobling in over 100 patients. And I know for sure that fluorocholine is a dead tracer compared to PSA. Uh, PSA because of this comparison, uh, just in the, even a few patients, you can see how much more sensitive it is. And if we look across uh, the comparison of fluorocholine with PSA, the target the background PSMA versus choline, every single patient, uh, you get much higher contrast. And because of the higher contrast, you're much more sensitive. And this is a comparison of the sensitivity for detection of disease in large series of, of studies, the one on the right from the Technical University in, in Munich uh, with um, fluorocholine, where in patients with a PSA of less than uh, one nanogram per mil, which is the area that surgeons start to worry uh, about uh, residual disease, uh, the sensitivity for detecting disease is 36%. If you look at the, the one on the left, which is the Heidelberg data uh, with um, uh, the PSMA, the, the left-hand graph is for PSAs less than 0.5 nanograms, and the sensitivity is 50%. In 50% of them, you're finding uh, disease in, in, in the, with the PSA that's that low. And these are the kind of nodes, and you know, everyone's very excited about the role of MR in prostate cancer. MR is never going to find those nodes. I can guarantee it. You know, that, you know we've, we've done the comparison already uh, in, in, in our own sector. These, these nodes are you know, three to four millimetres, and, and you, you're seeing them incredibly intensely. Uh, and bony metastases that you can sort of identify, but uh, again, uh, what would you pay for? We're, um, we started this in uh, September this year 
and th this was our analysis of the first uh, 50 or so cases we've done. We've done close to 80 now uh, in just a, a, a couple of months and it shows what the pent up demand for a diagnosis in this population is. And the vast majority of them are, are positive. There's, there's, there's a small number who are negative. Uh, and, and these are, are, are patients um, who have very, very low PSAs uh, or maybe uh, very low um, Gleason score and, and, and maybe false negative in the lumpology paradigm of finding lumps, but maybe telling us something very important about the biology of the, these tumours. So we'll obviously have to wait to see what the, the, the prognostic significance of a negative PSMA scan is versus a positive one, but it is uh, a, a very interesting. So let's go back with one. So this is patient number one. Um, who unfortunately is a friend of mine um, and uh, uh, he uh, told me he had an elevated PSA and he wasn't quite sure what to do about it because he'd had a negative uh, transrectal ultrasound and uh, this is the PMSA scan you can see the primary which is multifocal uh, a, uh, a pelvic sidewall node and a, uh, a, unfortunately a root metastasis as well uh, this is the, our first comparison in patient, I think, number two, of a patient that had a, a, um, a fluorocholine scan which showed a single uh, node, and you can see that the tumor to background ratio is just dramatically better with this tracer. Uh, and if you look at another node, three to four millimeter presacral node, not seen on the fluorocholine, clearly seen on the PMSA scan. And here, um, uh, another uh, case. Uh, with local recurrence, a, um, a pelvic sidewall node, uh, which again, uh, less than a centimetre in diameter, not abnormal by structural criteria, and a bone metastasis with no, you know, we all think you've got to have sclerotic bone meds in prostate cancer. We, we just see so many bone meds that have no structural correlate at all. And uh, local recurrence, beautifully seen. Uh, and we're starting to see patterns of metastasis which we didn't actually believe existed. You know, how, how many of you have seen uh, prostate cancer in the liver? It's very uncommon, but we've seen four or five cases that have small uh, metastases in the liver. It just isn't their dominant disease and probably never becomes dominant because their bone disease is a much more uh, prominent clinical feature. Uh, and it, also, as well as being sensitive, it's very specific. We don't get uptake in enlarged nodes, like this node here, which is thought very suspicious uh, for uh, prostate cancer on MR, but no uptake, and in subsequent sampling confirmed that there was no uh, prostate cancer in that cell. In the same way that we, we use peptides therapeutically in neuroendocrine tumours, uh, people are starting to use uh, PSMA therapeutically, and this is uh, from the Heidelberg group using uh, a radiolabeled uh, version of this with uh, uh, iodine, showing dramatic reduction in widespread metastatic disease with radionuclide therapy uh, targeting this particular area. And they, they showed quite dramatic reductions in peer. Uh, PSA levels in, in some of the patients uh, and uh, very good clinical uh, symptomatic benefit in the patients. I think this is a game changer, this, this tracer, because it, it meets an unmet need of where we don't have good imaging currently. It replaces two tests uh, that uh, um, would be relatively expensive to do together, fluorine 18 bone scans, fluorocholine scans, and the, the uh, equivalent of the standard bone scan Dominopelvic pelvic CT, which is incredibly insensitive and non-specific. Uh, it's a, um, uh, an area that where we might get into theranostics that using a diagnostic tracer to identify a target that can be uh, used therapeutically. But it doesn't stop there. We can do other stuff as well. There are all sorts of other targets. This is a chemokine receptor. Chemokines are associated with migration of cells and uh, particularly uh, the signalling between immune cells. Uh, and so diseases like lymphoma, where there's this complex interplay between uh, the, uh, the, the malignant clone and, and normal lymphocytes and normal cells, uh, can be imaged very beautifully. And so this is a, a kind of example of uh, an agent called gallium pentixifor. We're about to start some, 
to work in um, uh, mantle cell lymphoma and multiple myeloma where this uh, is highly expressed as well. Uh, and you can see the beautiful target background. Again, no brain uptake, so looking for CNS lymphoma, this should be a really exquisite and sensitive tool. There's almost no gut uptake, and, and, and uh, some lymphomas that have a particular predilection for, for gastrointestinal involvement, we think this is going to be a fantastic uh, tracer, and much better than the, the standard of care uh, in, uh, in terms of um, uh, the current tracers. Obviously, addressing the, the cost issue, decreasing the cost. Having off-site um, cyclotrons, uh, commercial radiopharmacies is great for long-lived tracers. For short-lived tracers, having a gallon generator on-site, like a general nuclear medicine department, you can milk it. Uh, you need uh, staffing models, you need high throughput, you need to bring the cost down, and you need to use your cameras very efficiently. And the more kinds of studies, a place like Peter Mac, we have no problem filling ca our cameras with FDG and we, we struggle to get all these other traces on. But last year, over a thousand of our seven and a half thousand scans were non-FDG uh, studies. Uh, but in most places, uh, they don't have as much oncology work and if they could do general nuclear medicine stuff uh, on them, then the cost would come down. The amortization equipment would be much more efficient. We can do it, uh, use it to, to image a whole range of things, including uterine therapy, so that if you're doing surtex, you can do quantitative dosimetry of what you've actually delivered. This is with uterine dotatate. Uh, we can start doing things uh, like MIBG scans with iodine-124 rather than iodine-123. The pictures are dramatically uh, more sensitive uh, and, and they're also intrinsically quantitative and so you can do dosimetry and if you compare I-131, an approved reimbursed tracer with I-124, their chalk and cheese again, uh, the ability to detect the extent of disease, but also to do dosimetry when uh, currently we lick our finger and put in the air and say, oh, we'll give them 100 millicuries or give them 150 millicuries. We have no idea what we're giving. The radiation oncologist would, would be horrified to think, what, you know, what dose are you giving? You know, we talk about an, uh, a dose as being an administered activity which has no relationship to radiation dose whatsoever. So, beyond conventional scintigraphy, uh, uh, PET's largely unexplored uh, beyond oncology. Uh, and I think that in the future we can start to look at all sorts of other things other than uh, FDG. So I mentioned that, that gallium generators are not new. One of the first papers we could find was from 1966 about gallium EDTA. Most of you would know that chrome EDTA is used for renal um, uh, assessment and, and so uh, was also used for, for brain imaging in the, in, in the past. But we thought, well, if you can label gallium with, uh, onto EDTA, perhaps we could do renal scans. And so this is on a human scanner of four mice injected simultaneously with gallium EDTA and these are time activity curves of looking at the transit of the bolus through the heart of a mouse into the kidneys and into the bladder uh, over time. And uh, we can do the same thing on humans. So you can see the activity going through the, the heart appearing in the aorta. Uh, go forward. So it's, this is a dynamic series, and we can again do time activity curves in fully three-dimensional quantitative terms of transit through the parenchyma into the collecting system and the collection in the bladder uh, over time. And uh, we've uh, done a comparison with the GFR measured using chromium uh, in a well counter with what we measure in the blood using it in imaging. We get an incredibly good correlation. And not only do we get that, we get a three-dimensional dynamic area. So there's, there's, there's a couple of outliers right at the very top where we know that chromium um, uh, doesn't work very well with very high GFR because you flood the, the camera. And these were actually artifactual results on chromium uh, imaging. When we recounted them, they came back into the uh, appropriate range. We've been using this in, in kitties uh, with the problem of uh, on, uh, ongoing incontinence, which is usually due to ectopic renal tissue in, in the wall of the bladder. Incredibly uh, disabling condition for kids. They're, they're, they're 
usually girls. They're wet, they usually have a vestigial ureter that goes into the top of their vagina and they just leak urine all the time. They're socially ostracised, they're miserable. Uh, and then this kid had had uh, ultrasound, it had MRI, it had standard uh, nuclear medicine scans, nothing had found it. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the scan uh, and this patient should complain, I hope. But I can show you the, the, the picture. Um, th there's ectopic renal tissue appearing before the ureter in the anterior aspect of the bladder. And this girl had an operation, it's now dry and it's a large chain. We've done eight kids now, uh, all of whom we've, we've found the, the site of ectopic renal uh, tissue. In the oncology setting, in patients who have pelvic accenturation, they often get uh, uh, you know, neo bladders and they leak and it's a real problem for them as well. They get fistulas, they get urinomas. Uh, the ability to do dynamic 3D imaging to see where it, where it goes is incredibly helpful uh, for, for the clinicians. Again, I don't think any of my movies are going to play today. Sorry about that. We're struggling to convince our colleagues that the PET has a role. Uh, you know, this is a commentary from the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, the peak body. It's difficult to foresee a handover of PET imaging for dynamic functional imaging, including nephrology, uh, because of its complexity. Uh, that, you know, all these areas that you need dynamic imaging, well, it's possible now. That, that myth is busted. You can do fully 3D imaging. We're doing lung scans with, with gallium. Galli gas and gallium MAA uh, can give you quantitative beautiful uh, <coughs> images of, of pulmonary embolus. We could combine it with the best state of the art uh, uh, an anatomy. This is a, a case of a patient with a lung cancer with a ventilation perfusion mismatch related to extrinsic compression of their artery by a tumor, not by a clot. Uh, we can identify that by combining a CTPA with a gallium MAA scan. And we can do, because we can do ventilation perfusion, we can now quantify the extent of, of unmatched, normal and matched perfusion abnormality. And this patient has both pulmonary embolism in their good lung, as well as a um, extrinsic compression in their bad lung. And so they have a combination of causes of, of mismatch in, in, in their lung. We can do blood pool imaging with high resolution and high contrast. So small hemangiomas in the liver suddenly become detectable with PET, that, you know, we're doing MRIs, we're doing magnavis, we're doing all sorts of things, ultrasounds, and when they get small, we can't, we still don't know what they are, and they're really problematic. And so we can start to see these uh, exquisitely beautiful. Lymphocentigraphy, you would have seen breast cancer and melanoma thing. We can do that with PET, with gallium nanocolloids. We're doing a, 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 a study now with prostate cancer where the ability to localise the nodes is very difficult. We can track these in fully three dimension temporally where the, the first sentinel node is and the surgeons laparoscopically, laparoscopically can go and sample that sentinel lymph node uh, uh, very sensitively. So PET remains a rather complicated technique that by production of F18 uh, agents, either in-house or by central or regional uh, pharmacies, requires a complex and technologically sophisticated infrastructure not to mention the sometimes challenging distribution logics. Again, it's a myth. It's busted. Gallium enables us to use kit-based radio traces for production similar to technetium and starts to bring this technology to the common man. So with that, I wish you good luck uh, in your efforts to try and go beyond FDG. And uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this quote. Human beings are almost unique in having the ability to learn from the experience of others, but also are remarkable in their apparent disinclination to do so. <coughs> I'm, I'm going to send that to uh, MSAC uh, next time, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, with that, I'd also like to thank my uh, molecular imaging and therapeutic uh, uh, team uh, at Peter Mack, who, who make all this work possible. And you know, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, share the work that they all do. Thanks very much.